We'll come back with a quick caveat on the M4 Block 2 upper. Now this is a genuine M4 Block 2 upper with Colt everything on the back end, with a Colt SOCOM profile barrel, DD2 wrist rail, with a front sight post exposed, and a Surefire 4 tine muzzle device. This is not the upper that we use. We use a Daniel Defense Block 2 upper. And of course, Josh being Josh, the muzzle device is not a clone correct item either. That said, uh, I don't think there is as much of a difference between a slow fire course because uh, on pure accuracy between the two uppers, and I've checked it, that particular upper actually outshoots this one. And this only has 300 rounds down the barrel itself. This was not in our possession when we filmed that one, so excuse us for that, but I think it still is a decent representation on the slow fire course. That said, I do want to focus our attention on the SME that we have on the show. Jeff Gerwich, longtime Special Forces operator, one of the first OGs who used the M4 Block II both in the schoolhouse and on deployment, and he is going to have a special segment where he talks about the M4 Block II upper. But if you're not familiar with him, I highly recommend you check out his channel, Modern Tactical Shooting, where Jeff goes over weapon systems like this, the mindset and the skill level of the special operations operator. But before we go too far, enjoy the practical accuracy segment, and we will see you guys at the debrief. Very windy today. Yep. But we're gonna make it happen. Well, let's see uh, what what this fancy special operations technology offers us. <laughs> All right, I'm on at 150. Impact. Impact. I'm on at two. Impact. Impact. I'm on at 250. Impact. Impact. Both of those were just on the bottom edge. I'm on at three. Impact. Impact. Good windage on those upper chest shots. Okay. Okay, target five, 350. Impact. Impact. Okay. Dude, nice. Okay, I'm on at four. Impact, dead center. Impact. I'm on at 450. Just underneath it, just underneath it, good windage. Just off the right edge, just scraped by, elevation's good. Impact. Impact. Okay. On at five, final target. Impact. Impact. Dude. What a good run for today, huh? And as you would expect from basically, I mean, this is, this right here, the block two is kind of, has, it's been the workhorse of SOCOM for the last, let's say decade, probably decade plus. Uh, a lot of times when you see SOCOM guys deploy, it's a 14.5 with a can and a shorty. They don't call them Mark 18s in, in the Army. It's just a shorty upper, per se. Right, um, so just to clarify on the Henry, what you're saying is that it, you basically deploy with a kit of a single lower receiver and then two variable option upper receiver groups, correct. a shorty and a 14.5. Correct. Or... And, and you would basically dress it towards whatever mission requirements. Yep. Or mission requires. However, 
if you are uh, Henry Chan and they run out of freaking M4s to deploy you, of course they would give you something like this in 2000 freaking 12. <laughs> so didn't you have a didn't they give you it with a a, a CAC a CAC Riz rail? Yeah, they actually gave me a, a, a CAC rail and I took it off. Because, because it was just like well, why why do, did I want a cack rail? I didn't have a peck unit anyway. It's just super thing. heavy on the front end. Yeah, they just gave me a cack rail and a bird grip, and I was like, well, I don't need that. <laughs> so I totally, like, I, I rocked it Cold War style for a while. But we're talking about the Block 2, which is way cooler looking and way more, you know, modern. And I say, Josh, very, very capable of a weapon system. So there's a lot that we need to cover on this. Um, what do we say we take it to the deep? Sounds good. See you guys there. See you there. Oh, well, hello there. You must have caught me freshening up the Nine Hole Reviews Mark 12. Now, did you know the Nine Hole Reviews is largely supported by Slate Black Industries and the patrons of Patreon? That's true. All those 77 OTMs, all those heartbreaks and range fees that we experience. Behind us, we have the patrons of Patreon, who support us not only financially and intellectually, but emotionally. So today I'd like to invite you to become one of us. Join us on Patreon and become a patron of Patreon. And if not, completely understand. We'd be just as happy to hear from you in the comments section down below. But for now, onwards we go. Alright, so welcome back into the debrief of what was another you know, really excellent run as far as I'm concerned. Henry, you got out there with only two misses on the whole course, both of them at 450, and both of them like scraping the by the target. Fly. If it were anything other than a reduced size season, you would have scored hits with those shots. And, but, you know, 450, tripping you up again, man. What's going on? Uh, yeah, 450, that was not the rifle's fault, uh, most certainly. Uh, it looked like the first shot was low. Uh, so that was a, a failure to judge the elevation. And then the second shot was to the right. Uh, so that was then elevation corrected and then popped it to the right with uh, a lack of windage correction. And so I, I, I think, I mean, it's certainly not the rifle's fault. I think the rifle has a capability of pushing uh, farther than 450 yards, obviously, about 400 meters. And... Uh, I do want to draw attention that we are going to talk to Jeff Gerwich over at Modern Tactical Shooting later, who is a longtime Special Operations Special Forces uh, veteran who not only was one of the first Green Berets to uh, get issued the M4A1 Block II, but one and, and taught other Green Berets the M4A1 uh, Block II, but also has multiple combat deployments on his belt. And he's going to talk about some of the capabilities of that. Uh, but I, I certainly don't think it was the rifle's fault. I certainly think that that was a, um, a slight misjudgment, mm -hmm. shall I say. Mm -hmm. uh, but it the rifle itself, uh, M4 Block 2, I think this is a good way of dropping back into a larger conversation about the M4 Block 2. Because I, I see it get thrown around in collector's circles like the m4 block 2 itself is an entity um, as in block 2 designates that it is a future generation of the m4 um, whereas what would be a little bit more accurate um, i would say is the uh, m4's second upgrade program with a package of stuff that goes with the m4 that makes it even more lethal um, could, so the, couldn't agree more, right? Couldn't agree more. It's it's yeah. routinely thought of, I would say, as a as an actual like issued developed version of the M4, uh, as right. opposed to a modernization kit. Yeah, and and if we really want to delve into this even more, it's just an upper. It's just the upper that was the upgrade 
portion. It wasn't even the entire, like an entire rifle that was upgraded because the block program, the SOP mod block one and block two programs were the two main upgrade programs to the small arms for the, uh, the SF, the SOCOM fighter uh, per se during the GWAT eras. Uh, the next one would be, of course, the URGI. Uh, mm-hmm. But let's focus on the Block 1 and the Block 2. Uh, so the Block 2 in, in specific. The program itself, first of all, came with two uppers. Of course, we have the M4A1 Block 2 upper that we saw in this video. But the other upper would be a shorty. What's in Army terms, you could just call it a shorty. Uh, which is what we a lot of times know as the Mark 18 in the civilian circles. And on top of that, you have the suppressors, the Surefire SOCOM. And uh, then you also have your illumination devices, both infrared and white light illumination devices. And then you also have um, the optical upgrades, Mm. which is going to be a choice between the EOTEX the ACOG in a lesser extent, and more frequently seen uh, the Elcan Spectre DR um, one to four X uh, scope. Now, obviously, today we're not running the Elcan Spectre DR, which is the classic approach to the Block Two program, and most seen overseas when the Block Two was you know in its heyday. Um, but the ACOG TA thirty one technically it's not even a TA thirty one Echos, but it's a TA-31 nonetheless. It's the closest we have on hand to replicate a 4X scope in that type of environment. And that day was not the easiest shooting environment I oh, from what I remember. I remember specifically you actually were addressing uh, the hold off for wind uh, as, as close in as the 250 to 300 uh, yard targets um, starting to favor uh, slightly off center at, the, at that point, which is... Uh, fairly quick and you know there has to be a relatively significant win for that to be a requirement now josh before we get too far into the weeds of analyzing the exact you know actions taken when we were on the practical accuracy course i do want to bring on my friend jeff gerwich and we talked about him earlier he's a long time uh long time special forces operator and has a wealth of knowledge but on top of that specifically for two rifles that I really lean on his expertise here. The um, M4 Block 2 upper cladded M4 Block 2 special operations rifle, but then also the SCAR-16 because he was deeply involved in both of those programs. And um, Jeff is going to talk about not only the history, the development, but also what was the expected performance uh, of the M4 Block 2 for the SOCOM operator of the era. So take it away, Jeff. Jeff Gerwich here. A little bit about my background first. I joined the Army in 1990, just in time to participate in Desert Storm in 1991. I served seven years in the infantry and 19 years with Special Forces. A total of 26 years in the Army. I used SOFMOD Block 1 when I was in 5th Special Forces Group, did three tours of Iraq. Now, when SoftMod Block 2 came out in 2007, I was actually serving as an instructor at our primary CQB schoolhouse at Fort Bragg. And because we were instructors, we actually received SoftMod Block 2 first before any of the SF groups got it. That way we could be trained on how to use it and then train our fellow Green Berets on the proper use of these SoftMod Block 2 items. And of course, I used SoftMod Block 2 items on all three of my tours in Afghanistan with 3rd Special Forces Group. Uh, leading up to my retirement in early 2017. Now, concerning SoftMod Block 2 performance, specifically with that SU-230, that Elkan Spectre 1 to 4 or 1 or 4 variable power optic, in training in our advanced rifle marksmanship program, we would regularly shoot out to 650 meters uh, using Mark 262 ammunition out of our uh, 14 and a half inch barreled M4A1s. Of course, this is just an M4A1 clone. But we were able to, again, regularly hit out to 650 yards, really no problem using this setup. And in combat, I mean, 5.56 uh, out of a 14 and a half inch gun 
is easily a 500 meter bullet and out of our Mark 18s, one can get hits past 400 with a shorty Mark 18 barrel. Now concerning overall performance of soft mod block two compared to block one, the main items, the LE5 laser, that Elcan, and I wanna mention the Daniel Defense RIS-2 front sight post version rail. Those are the big hitting items within SF that guys really liked. Of course, that LE5 had the red visible laser, so you, it was co-aligned, so you could zero it, not requiring to be in total darkness to zero your IR laser. Much stronger beam, and that LA-5 took up half the rail space on your rail between whatever optic you had and the front sight post. Of course, later on, we would receive a non-front sight post version, basically because the LA-5 ideal placement really sits right where the front sight post is. That allows you to have plenty of grip behind the LA-5. And of course, the reason why uh, guys wanted a quad rail, a full length quad rail, is to go with a modern style of gripping. When I joined SF in 1998, the V grip was still pretty popular. Uh, and over time, as you know, our techniques of shooting evolved, the uh, C clamp style grip, whether you do elbow high or dropped elbow, but C clamp with your thumb on top of the rail really became the grip of choice. So you need more rail to do that, especially with a laser. The old PEQ2 style IR laser takes up all this space right here, really no matter what optic you've had. And of course that Elcan, that SU-230, that one to four scope is probably responsible for more kills on the enemy in Afghanistan than any other scope. Now, in the last five years, you're gonna hear a lot of complaints within SF about the reliability of that Elcan scope. But you gotta remember, we got those issued in 2007. They've never been maintenanced by the manufacturer and years and years of back-to-back -back combat deployments and hardcore training has really just worn those optics out. I don't think there's any other scope out there that could have lasted as long as that Elcan 1-4. to And you gotta keep in mind, in 2007, our optic choices were, of course, the ACOG, which awesome optic, but it's a fixed four power. Vortex had just come out with their variable power one to four, and really the quality is only at, at the civilian level. It definitely was not a duty grade scope. The only other real option out at the time was the Schmidt and Bender short dot, that one to four. Price point wise, I think it was around $1,100 back then. That was out of the price range of what your average SF sol uh, soldier is going to use his own money for, and we just weren't getting them bought with unit funds. So when the 1-4 to four Elcan came out, really, it, our first hardened military duty ready 1-4 to four scope. Of course, things changed in 2010. I believe the Vortex Razor 1-6 to six came out. 1-6 to six scopes elevating your game with an AR. And in the military, it's not about stretching the distance of 5.56. Five, no matter what barrel length, this is a practical gun out to around 500 yards in combat, but running a one to six scope increases one's capability to hit shots within that 500 yard or 500 meter range. I ran an Elcan one to four on two of my combat tours in Afghanistan. It was my last tour. I thought the Elcan was out of date in its capability. It's a one to four. I purchased my own one to six scope. This is a Trijicon VCOG. I wanted that extra magnification to increase my ability to hit threats within that 500 meter range. And the last softmod block two item that really made an impact in how we rigged our rifles and you know, affected how we use our rifles is the Surefire SOCOM suppressor. Now it's heavy by today's modern suppressor standards, but as far as reliability and practicality, the Surefire SOCOM suppressor is light years ahead of the older uh, softmod block one Knights armament suppressor. When we first got issued those, they weren't popular. And running suppressed really wasn't in our culture in the late 90s, early 2000s. But all that changed in 2007 with the Surefire SOCOM suppressor. It's not a popular option on 14 and a half inch M4A1s, but that was the same time around 2007, 2008, regular SF teams started getting issued the Mark 18 Shorty. The Mark 18 paired with a Surefire SOCOM suppressor is almost the ideal setup for combat. You have a gun that's not too long, it's not gonna be that front heavy, 
with that suppressor yet the recoil is cut down because it's suppressed no muzzle signature so a super awesome setup for almost every application in combat not perfect for afghanistan because of the extreme distances we were engaging the enemy at but there's better weapon systems for that for a personal defense weapon when you're out there doing cqb clearing buildings uh, mark 18 suppressed is a great combo so overall, I think the consensus within special operations is that soft mod block two, whether it was mounted to Mark 18s or M4A1s was a roaring success, especially in Afghanistan. Soft mod block two items allowed our special operations members to come out on top in hundreds upon hundreds of engagements with the enemy and win beating them on the ground. Uh, in firefights, special operations, Rangers, SF, MARSOC, basically unbeatable, uh, and that is in part due to soft mod block two. Some very valuable and interesting information here. My primary takeaway, having listened to Jeff's uh, both interview that he, he's done with you here, Henry, as well as his full video on the Block 2 program, uh, which is available on his channel, is the relevance of the optic and the importance of being able to add the optic into the setup to increase capability. And I love the fact that one of the things that is addressed is the rifle's capability is that of a, you know, beyond 500 meter gun, definitely able to hit shots beyond 500 meters, which we also know it is, teaser for later. Um, <laughs> but not only that, that within the scope of, you know, this, this firearm that's capable at these distances, you know, within the scope of what we do on the show, you have a tendency or a capability, I suppose, to demonstrate iron sights very effectively. And in many instances, that can lead to potential, well, we'll just call them um, inaccurate conclusions that the whole like iron sights are just as good. You should be just as good with the iron sight bit. It's just simply inaccurate. And uh, that was probably one of the more interesting takeaways that I had, you know, listening to Jeff's uh, total time spent even within his own video, again, where so much of it was devoted to conversations on the optic itself and that improvement to the system. Well, yeah, I think I think a lot of times uh, for many shooters out there, especially in the civilian market, you know, having an ability of putting stuff onto your rifle, you forget that it, it, it the optic itself becomes a, a part of the rifle, right? So, um, but a lot of times, still the the emphasis is on the the base rifle itself exactly but it really ought to be looked at from a weapon systems perspective your optics your base rifle and your ammunition spent with jeff he talks about all three specifically he talks about the elcan one to four the base rifle of the or the base upper in this case functions mostly for the rifles functions and then the um the 77 grain um otms the mark 262 ammunition that they used right all three of these made up that weapon system that was extremely lethal that stretched the m4's capabilities way past uh what it originally was expected upon for for the regular soldier mm -hmm. and we can't time travel right and a lot of times the opposite of what we don't know we don't know is also what we do know we cannot erase from our minds and, ex and act like we don't know. So it's difficult to drop ourselves back into a past tense and think of things in terms of what was life before there were one to, four, one to six X LPVOs that were readily available and fairly easy to purchase and cheap. Yeah, like from and every so, manufacturer, right? Like from every right. major manufacturer making quality lpvos mm -hmm. right and, and not not and first focal plane lpvos might i add so then you have not only do you have the amazing vortex razor glass which it, for me it's a little on the heavy side but still the glass quality is amazing and then you also have primary arms that just focuses a lot of its attention onto the reticle the reticle itself for there then becomes the a field ballistic calculator machine and it entirely takes away a lot of that guesswork uh, and compare and contrast that to what we have with an ACOG 
uh, I would say the interesting thing there is the resurgence of the piggyback RMR slash back in the day would be the doctor side. Um, and because in turning the ACOG into something that's way more powerful than the originally envisioned ACOG 4X hyper ruggedized scope. The so bottom line is a lot of this development, a lot of these ancillary developments that go to it has a a root that draws back to the base system. You know, that base upper that was developed. Sort of like the concept of the Mark 12 um, special purpose receiver that could just be slapped on as you needed. This was the era of the GWAT era where they recognized that, hey, these upper receiver groups could be swapped around. And if we make it integrate with all this stuff around it, the possibilities of doing anything, of com continually upgrading the system, is the sky's the limit for us. And that's essentially what they did. And so we, for us, Josh, I mean, yeah, some of these things are clone incorrect that we have on it. The ACOG with ACSS Aurora that we have is a much more powerful version of an ACOG than the regular version, purely because of the reticle itself. It helps me aid in elevation and windage adjustment. And even though I kind of messed up those two shots at 450, I was quickly able to regain uh, uh, the the follow on shots. I, I want to interject on that point, Henry. You know, one of the things that Jeff talked about in um, in his in his conversation on the Elcan specifically was how the the reticle because it's timed for I believe he he had mentioned it was time the the Elcan back in the day was time for M eight five five, but his team would commonly use it with the Mark two six two seventy sevens. And they would have to know that there was a difference in where the rounds would impact in relation to the pre-established stadia within the optic. Mm -hmm. Do you think that that actually probably may very well have been a cause for why your first shot zipped low? Uh, maybe, maybe, because we're in a very similar situation because mm -hmm. the ACSS Aurora is for the six cam for 62 Just grain. Mm -hmm. um, M855 rather than 77s. At which we Maybe. were shooting it with, right? Yeah. I felt like the performance, despite us needing to use an ACOG TA31 in lieu of a, um, a Spectre DR 1 to 4, I felt that the performance was fairly representative of the actual Block 2. And it's interesting because it, to me, these trends almost. I don't know if I should consider this a transitional era rifle, but the front sight post, the front sight post still being on there uh, as a vestigial item from the yesteryears, <laughs> I think that stuff looks looks really cool. So, so the farther away you you get from that era of the front sight post being there, um, the closer you arrive to where we are right now as of filming twenty twenty two. Right. And I think those transitional era small snippets that, that remind you that right before that, you know, guys were still qualifying with M16A2s in basic with iron sights rather than uh, optics. I mean, that's, that's a cool throwback for me to see. The, and the second element of this is let, let's talk about that transition and how it takes place. You know, you, you've sort of, given me the the philosophy that you believe which seems to be completely accurate as far as i can tell at least in the u.s setting which is adoption of a thing by socom trial tested flush through proven and then in many instances like rolled out in some shape or form to regular army regular fighting force and we also know that the predecessor to adoption by SOCOM is trial and use in the civilian market. And not just the wide scale civilian market, but the very niche and specific place that I come from uh, being, you know, high level competition shooting where every minute advantage is trying to be scraped out of a platform. And in some cases, absolutely ridiculous devices and tools are developed to try to do that. But in other cases, the competition market sort of acts as a test bed to proof concepts before you have the military beginning to adopt VSOCOM. If we're looking at 
Um, I, I cannot say definitively that the three gun community has had a strong uh, influence on specifically the block two system, but it certainly has had an influence of bringing new products to the market that end up getting tested by SF operators. And in Jeff's case, the interesting thing is they found that the Elkan Spectre, the SU-230, was maybe not, it's good, but it, it still had some room for improvement. And he went out to buy his own VCOG. And you'll see a lot of what in the clone in the clone world they call uh, out in the wild, which would be operators going out and using either personal funds or unit funds to buy uh, commercial items and dropping it onto the uh, the military systems. And then, of course, you see that come into fruition, come into reality. The Marines adopted the VCOG at some point. Um, it, I'm not saying that that was a direct correlation that they saw the SF use it. But then seeing the LPVO getting pushed onto your military rifles and being used in combat and seeing that they do have a relevance in the field, uh, it turns into that cycle of the civilian, uh, the civilian manufacturers testing it on competition shooters, then SF guys picking it up, whether officially or unofficially, and then the larger military forces looking at what's going on in SF and considering that as a viable option to, to pick up. And I would say it's not just in the field of, of small arms either. Using Jeff as an example again, um, as our SME in this video, you know, his final deployment to Afghanistan in the 2014-15 era, if you look at that rifle, it's got an LPVO with a 45 degree doctor style little micro red dot sight. It has a, I believe it has an Arredondo Magwell and an extended rail system, a quad rail system, as opposed to, you know, sort of like a slick rail system, which would have been what the civilian market had moved into around that time while the military was still on exclusively quad rails and a Geisley trigger pack in the rifle. I mean, those are some of the most quintessential upgrades that somebody who would be buying a rifle to go shoot three gun would be looking for. Now, like high level competition shooters are messing with the gas system and the weight of the internals and things of that nature. But for the average individual who wanted to go compete, those would be the easy adjustments that they would make to, you know, a rack gun. Add an LPVO, maybe add a doctor site. You could throw on a magwell, match trigger, extend the rail system. Like that entire look, feel, and functional elements that are provided by those items, I think are direct derivatives. One thing you touch upon that is a hard a hard no on why you could not tune some of the gas systems, et cetera, is because of field use. You know, the, you, the, this should be taken with a grain of salt that, you know, when you tune your rifle to, you know, to where it just barely recoils, you also potentially could suffer from functional issues Absolutely. in the field. Uh, so it may not be a big deal in a competition environment, but it could be a big deal in the SOCOM community, which is why... When we look back at that circle, at that cycle, it doesn't go straight from a competition shooter into the general military's hands. In the in the trend that we've been seeing, it goes from manufacturer to competition shooter to refine the technology into a uh, special operations guy, whether officially or un unofficially purchased, and then into and then have them refine it or militarize the system, and then the big army, big military ends up picking it up. Mm -hmm. in the long term all right so with all that said you know the rifle is heavy the 14.5 configuration especially with the suppressor it's a heavy setup with the riz rail the full quad rail um but extremely rugged especially with this the elcan or the acog optic setups and extremely capable when paired with the Mark 262 ammunition. Has an option to use a suppressor 
in a manner that doesn't make it completely unwieldy, although maybe a short barreled system is uh, is a bit more ideal for running um, a suppressor if you intend to run suppressor more frequently than not. But on the whole, is the Block 2 of all of the rifles that we've brought on the show that have some connection back outside of the modern civilian market into some form of historic military use is this like the rifle that you would want like is this the system that is quote unquote best you know i don't like to use the word best because it's subjective under a number of circumstances but is this the best one that we've brought on the show thus far as a general purpose like infantryman setup no Obviously, the best rifle that was modernized from an old system is the AK-12. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Do not end it with that. No, that was a, that was that was a, that was a direct dig. The <laughs> the M4 Block II, in my opinion, was a damn good modernization program. It was a refined second version modernization program to breed extra lethality and more points uh, to diversifying the M4's uh, uh, capabilities into something even more than what it was originally designed for. Um, I think for the era, and this is huge caveats here, for the era, the M4 Block II was, was in fact one of the best, if not the best options that SOCOM could have gone with. And so I think it is no mystery why SOCOM used the M4 Block II uh, just you know the upper with with the entire block two program for so long. Why it just remained in SOCOM inventory for so long before they even uh, even looked at MLOC and the URGI systems. And also, if you look at it, the direct competitor to it would of course be the Mark sixteen, the Scar sixteen, as many of us know it in the civilian world. Now, a lot of us in the civilian world who have had experience with a SCAR-16 will, uh, you know, may actually really enjoy it and feel like some of those digs towards a SCAR-16 were unwarranted. But we've, we have to look at it from the era itself. If I were sitting in 2022 and my options were a Block 2 or a SCAR-16, I would choose a SCAR-16. Uh, the SCAR-16 has had time to get refined, despite not really having a widespread adaptation in the military. Um, really, nice. I think Rangers use them and select SF guys. Jeff used it a few times during his missions. But that took time to get from where it was, and it was absolutely not ready uh, back in the day when it was first introduced. It was not ready for mass deployment or, or mass consumption. Right, the point, the point being the SCAR-16 of today is not the same SCAR-16 that was right. initially uh, presented in trials for adaptation. Right. So if you're looking at something of that era, you drop us back in 20, 2015 through 2017 time frame, and you're looking at, hey, you know, these are your options, a, an, an era correct SCAR that the military had in inventory or an M4 Block 2 system with all of the accoutrements that go with it. I would absolutely choose the M4 Block 2 uh, with all of the little block systems that go with it. Even if it didn't have the block systems that went with it, you could still go out and buy your own stuff as, as an operator yourself and kit it out as you need it. Because like you said, it's essentially a military rifle with competition rifle elements. And on top of that, other things that add to its lethality. And the biggest thing that it has for it is that it has a base system of the M4A1. At this point, decades in development, hyper-reliable, a system that everyone knows how to maintain and work with. It is the baseline. It is the gold standard of the soldier in the U.S. military. And so all of those elements combined, the M4 Block II upper and the M4 Block II uh, system itself absolutely earns its right in becoming one of the giants in SOCOM small arms history and why so many guys in the clone community like it, so many guys in the SF community look upon it favorably and fondly, there are definitive reasons for that.
there you have it guys we want to thank jeff again for acting as our SME here on this episode of course do all of that youtube stuff the likes the subscribes the comments let us know what you think about the block two in the comment section below and of course be sure to check us out on utreon until next time we'll see you on the range Hey guys, we've got a pretty sweet Speedway episode coming up for you, so you don't want to miss that. But a small easter egg to go on top of that. If you look at that photo where Jeff was pulling security with his Block 2, look closely at the magazine. It's actually half full. That's because he just stepped off of a major firefight in Logar Province. And Logar Province, for those uninitiated, is a fairly rowdy province in Afghanistan. Seven one six this is Bill Knight six four six eight packs red con one green to green top copy over. Bill Knight six this is seven one six Roger over. One six Bill Knight one one pack green green over. Seven one six Roger over. One six Bill Knight two one big two two packs red con one.